this keep it back here something like this <gasps> yeah it's about that time Bonjour, Abanigani, buenos dias. Abanigani, that's Swahili. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Swahili. Swahili speakers. All right. Good to see everybody and Todd this morning. <laughs> here in our Sunday morning class. Uh, Danny, I cannot advance the slides. Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to be starting out this morning with an example of, uh, oh, hi, everyone out there. Uh, don't want to forget you. Um, we're starting out this morning with an example of what we're going to be doing on Wednesday nights, which is going to be a departure and thus far. Okay, so we started out with the uh, study in, in uh, the Thessalonian letters, but uh, subsequent to that, as the Bible reading was brought to the fore, then our elders wanted to have uh, something where we kind of all involved and keeps us going and whatnot. And so um, uh, we're going to be, uh, I'll give you an, kind of an example of that as we start out this morning of uh, taking um, some of the, what we might call the nuggets from the readings and taking, bringing those up to the fore and talking about them. So as you're reading through your Bible, uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, discuss and talk about uh, some of the things that, that are contained in those readings. Um, and so I think that'll be uh, beneficial and, and, uh, and fun. Uh, uh, Danny, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the presentation mode has, okay. You guys can see it pretty good from there. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going here. Our loving Father, we give you thanks this morning for your grace and the hope and the future that we have through the, through the blood of Christ, that great sacrifice uh, that you, because of your deep love for us, made available so that if we would but put our faith in him and put our trust in in you and in your provision that we have that home assured for us in heaven. And we look so forward to actually experience uh, what you have prepared for those who love you. We thank you for your word and that we have uh, been influenced and moved and willing to be in a situation as we are this morning focusing our minds upon these things which you have revealed so that we may know you de more deep may be shining lights in this world as we have opportunity. We pray that your presence among us and that you would give us insight and understanding. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. So while I was musing this past week over our studies and where they're going and just, uh, you know, just musing. It occurred to me that as we had started in this survey that there was something that I missed. Uh, I mean, there is so much. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not like there's three or four things, you know, that you can bring up. And uh, but uh, but I just for whatever reason my mind went back to the Red Sea, 
and what happened there, and then something that the Apostle Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 10 as he points back to that. Okay? And again, it's just one another one of these connections that uh, are so, at least to me, they're so faith-building because you see the forethought of God and all these little details of things, you know, and you don't, you know, you, as you get more familiar with the Bible as a whole, you start seeing these, these connections. You're just like, man, God was, everything he was doing was purposeful. You know, there was something that, that's coming that this is just a reflection of. You know, it's just, just fascinating. And so this is one of those things. And so I thought about the, uh, the Red Sea and that the people passed through the Red Sea. And then what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 10 here, where uh, he says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers uh, were all under the cloud, and all pass through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. And then he says in verse 5, nevertheless, now we're not going to, go into all he says after nevertheless, but that nevertheless means that there should have been a certain result of that, that it didn't come about. It should have, but it didn't. So, so even though these things occurred, the people still didn't act accordingly. So what is he talking about here? And so he says our fathers... Uh, we're all under the cloud, and of course we know the cloud that the people were, you know, that God was leading them, the cloud and the fire. And uh, we're all under the cloud and passed through the sea. And now when they passed through the sea, they were baptized into Moses. Okay? So in the New Testament, we can read about uh, six baptisms. You know, we have this baptism into Moses. Uh, John's baptism, baptism in fire, baptism of suffering, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and baptism, uh, you know, into Jesus Christ, or baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And that's really, well, we say, well, there's six baptisms, but Paul says in Ephesians there's one, and there is one, okay? And so four of those are past. Uh, one of them, depending on how you look at it, we're not going to get into, but one of them, uh, it is said, and I'm not de def uh, refuting it, I'm just saying it said that that's future, the baptism in fire. You know, depart into the eternal fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. And one exists today, and that is baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. So you have a situation in Acts where uh, the household of Cornelius is baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then Peter commands that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And so, so that's the one baptism. So they're baptized into Moses. What does that, uh, you know, what does that indicate? Yeah, Tony? Sure. Sure. So, so when they were in Egypt, who, who, under whose control were they? Okay. They were under Pharaoh's control. Okay. So now as they're passing through the Red Sea, as Paul is using this here, they're under Moses' control. So they're, so they're baptized into Moses' uh, authority, if you will. Okay. You know, authority that he had from God. But they're, you know, so there was a covenant involved back then. There's a covenant involved today. So... So they're baptized into Moses under his, under his authority in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. So now God provided food for them in, with the manna. And God twice provided water for them 
miraculously, okay? Now, as they're eating this food that comes miraculously out of heaven and drinking this water that's miraculously supplied for them, to them, we're talking about the benefits that they are enjoying from God. God is directly, miraculously providing these things for them. Now, what kind of a response would it seem reasonable that the people would have as God is <laughs> providing miraculously for them? Okay? And so, so the idea is that it was it should have been spiritually nourishing to them to partake of that manna and that water because God is directly providing it for them, right? And so that, sh you know, should have been uh, the result that they wouldn't fall, that that would sustain them. But let me ask you, Food that and water that God provided miraculously or just plain food and water, so to speak, that wasn't is the, the food and the water itself in and of itself isn't anything special, right? It, in other words, just because it was miraculously provided by God didn't mean that it had some in and of itself, some properties to it that other food wouldn't have. See what I'm saying? But they should have connected in their, in their hearts and their minds the fact that God is caring for them and providing for them, and that be a catalyst for them to be faithful. And that's why he says, nevertheless, even though they should have been spiritually nourished by this food and water, they still fell. Todd? Yes. Well, I think we are because we're we're the the food and the water that was provided is just well well it's a manif well they but they actually ate and they actually drank is what I'm saying okay but that was that is evidence of the fact that they are in this direct relationship with this spiritual being because that was miraculously supplied see what I mean so I don't think we're saying different things necessarily but. I'm looking at the food and the water that it was actual, real, not spiritualized, metaphoric food and water. They received it. And, and even though they had this connection with this, with God, and it was manifest in God's providing for them in the wilderness, that didn't have the effect on them that it should. It should have enrich them spiritually oh, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and again, it's a. Yeah. And so, as we, as New Testament Christians, think about what God uh, has done and does for us. Not. I'm not saying necessarily in a miraculous way, but that's another discussion. Um, that there should be a response on our part. You know, we know we we sit down and eat uh, food, for instance. And sometimes I, you know, I'll look at the food and say, I got some, uh, you know, you know, chicken and something on the on the plate. Well, I realize that if all the chickens in the world disappeared, we wouldn't have chicken anymore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially, you know, the gospel bird, you know, preachers, you know, we live on chicken, right? So. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah, I mean, if they're all they're gone, we can't make any more, right? See, I mean, this, this is God's doing. He provided this. We could never have provided it for ourselves. So we sit down and we bow our head and we thank him. See? So when we eat with gratitude, is that food nourishing us spiritually? When we understand, you see what I mean? So looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's what I think is what he means by spiritual. You know, it, it's that recognizing the source of it, and without, without God, they couldn't have had it. You know, we're hungry, you sent us out here to die. We should go back to, you know, back to Egypt. And, you know, he provides the manna, he provides the quail, he provides the, the water. And even though he did that, nevertheless, they still fell. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's that's. So we're you know we're, we're kind of talking about the same thing. Mm Yeah, that's right. Sure. That's right. Yeah. So he told the people there in John, "You you seek me. Uh, I say to you, to you, you seek me not not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes." Okay, in verse 27, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So it's just saying that food in and of itself, just food, see. Um, and then in verse 49 here, it, he says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. Okay? And so the food in and of itself isn't the thing. See? It's, the, it's the benefit that comes from that, yeah. Right, 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 absolutely, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Steve's saying that although. God provided these blessings, the manna and the water. They could have chosen not to partake of those, the, the benefit, right? And it's just like, like the parallel with us to them is, for instance, when they do, you know, so at least an element, let's just go back to Egypt. Instead of sticking with God, receiving these benefits and these blessings, and... Uh, submitting to his plans and, and whatnot. They could have, they opted. And so sometimes we can do the same thing. Well, this is too hard. I don't get it. Uh, God disappointed me, whatever it may be. So I'm going to go back to Egypt. See, and then leave the blessings and go back to the, you know, leave the steak and go back to the, the bologna. <laughs> whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Tony. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So Tony points out that it depends on how we're thinking. If we're if we receive those ble- blessings, walk in those blessings, it has to do with how we think. All right. Very good, Gina. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So Gina is saying that, that that they should have been devoted to God, blessings that they were receiving, um, and so should we, right? But sometimes we can, you know, because of our own thinking, erroneous thinking. Uh, we can not receive those blessings, and you know, and kind of and kind of leave them. Um, and so we have to be careful with that. It reminds me of Hebrews Hebrews eleven, Hebrews twelve twenty eight. Uh, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, never be destroyed, we are we are we are living forever. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and all. So it's because of that gratitude, that gratitude is one of the greatest motivators for us to serve God. And that's what Paul is saying. He did all this. Nevertheless, they didn't show their gratitude. They didn't show the appropriate gratitude for what had been provided for them. Yeah, very good. Todd?
where he saved the Israelites from from God. Okay. Yes, he, he was going to. From that wrath, yeah, yeah. So as so as so we're talking about Moses as a mediator between uh, God and man, okay? Um, and yeah, and that's a good that's a good uh, type show a parallel there. And so just like uh, Moses was a mediator, Jesus is the one mediator. As Paul points out, there is one mediator. Okay, Moses. No, now it's Christ is that is that mediator between us, high priest, uh, etc. Um, okay, I had something else going here, but it'll it'll pop up. Uh, <laughs> it always does. <laughs> yeah, it was really good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a genius as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and it's it's an interesting thing. Um, Without, without Christ mediating, then there's there wrath awaits. Okay, judicial, righteous, fair. God's wrath awaits. Okay, but let us not think, and I don't, and I know we're not propagating that. I'm just just saying, let us never think that if God had His way we would be destroyed because it was his way to send his son. Okay? So it was because of his love that Jesus came. So because he doesn't want to be lost and wants no one to perish, you know, and all those, those passages. Uh, so, let, so never think that. If, if we come under the wrath of God, ultimately, then it will be because... Um, well, in our sermon this morning, you'll get a really, you know, good idea of some of these things. But um, it'll be because we just made the wrong choices. Uh, God knows the heart. And nothing that a person that's lost experiences, are they going to be able to say, hey, this isn't right. You know. So anyway, that's a, that's a deep subject. You know, we can really get into a lot of, of things, but that but the mediator is there because God wants us to be with Him. Period. Okay. So this is the kind of thing we'll be doing on Wednesday, on Wednesday night. We'll take our reading and we'll we'll go through there, and I'll, you know, pick some things out and present them. And if you have things that you see that man, this I, this would be really good to talk about, then we can talk about it. Okay. And uh, so it, I'm excited about that. So it'll be it'll be really good. We'll be all over the Bible. The, the New Testament, they'll going to push you into the new, just like it's doing here. So we'll be able to see these how these things connect. And and uh, I just think your your faith, uh, as deep as it may be now, will will be even deeper. Okay, as we as we do that. All right, all right. Any questions? Um, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about. The, um, the tabernacle that, that uh, here in the book of Exodus is, uh, is going to be uh, erected. It's going to be, uh, God's going to give all the directions for it. And it's, you know, we could you read all those details about, and one of the things, you know, when, when, uh, when I read about the tabernacle, the same, and it's the same with the temple, as he's describing all these things, I have, I have, absolutely no ability to picture it at all. I mean, I don't know about you, but, I, but as he's talking about how these things fit together and, and everything, it's just, you know. You know, I really like those lips, Gina, by the way. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I look back there and I see this big smile, you know. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, there's some things about it that, 
are important and, and reflected in these passages up here. And what these passages here are saying is that uh, God, when, when the tabernacle was being, when the, when the furnishings and all the things that went with it were being created, and as it's put together, God told him to see to it that he make everything according to the pattern that was shown him on the mountain. So God revealed a pattern for the tabernacle, and he said, you see to it that you make this exactly as I told you. And so the question is, again, why was that so important? Well, it's important because God said to do it that way, but why did he, why did he do that? Okay. Tony? Yeah. Yeah, and so and so yeah, it's fulfilled in Christ, um, and we're going to take a look at some of that here in, in as we go. Um, and uh, you know, in the course of things, you know, I was thinking the other day. I was, I'm going to say, in the course of things, you know, hopefully we can get to some preaching that deals with the. Uh, the type and shadow relationship between things in the tabernacle is really fascinating. But I was thinking the other day, you know, it's like, man, if I had 25 or 30 years to preach here, that wouldn't be long enough to share everything that, you know, it's just, you know, it's just mind boggling. But let's want to talk about this, this uh, directive of God to, to do it like I said, okay? Uh, and so, this is a, you know, a diagram of the of the tabernacle. And of course, you know, when you get into the book of Hebrews and you start talking about the uh, the tabernacle and the priesthood and the and the uh, the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Uh, and so, when the priests were uh, attending to the altar and doing their duties in the tabernacle. They were serving a copy and shadow of the heavenly. Okay, and so the Hebrew writer talks about the the, the true tabernacle, uh, which God made and not man. So there's a tabernacle uh, that this tabernacle is only a reflection, a dim reflection of. Okay, and so I'm going to submit to us that this tabernacle. Is a, is a representation of heaven, okay? And when you, when you read the details uh, of the tabernacle, now you can get kind of like, it's one of those readings where you can kind of, you know, maybe I should just skip this, <laughs> you know, part of it. Um, but those details tell a story, okay? They tell a story, all right? And so... And if we look at this tabernacle and think about the church, okay, was God pointing forward to something that this tabernacle represents? And I think that he was in the furnishings and, and some of the things here that, that, we, uh, that we can uh, look at. Um, so I don't, okay, so I have the, yeah, I have this kind of, uh, it's going to just do this. See how many circles I have up there. Okay. Okay, that's my, that must be it. So think about this now. All right. So if, if you know, if I could, you know, I can see a shadow of my hand on here. Okay. So the shadow, it, that's not my hand. Okay. This is my hand. I can't slap you with this thing that it's reflected. Okay, I can slap you with this, <laughs> okay, you know, or shake your hand or <laughs> pat you on the back. I don't know why I went to slap, so, you know, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, so when you look at the tabernacle, it's not the church, but it sure is a shadow of it. I mean, for instance, so say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a priest, okay, and I'm going to enter in 
to the, into the tabernacle grounds, and I'm going to work my way into the tabernacle. Okay. Okay, so I come in, and the first thing I'm going to find is a priest standing next to that altar of burnt offering. If there's no sacrifice, you ain't coming in. Okay? And so that's a pretty easy parallel. Without the sacrifice, none of us are in Christ. We're not the church. There's no such thing. So the first thing is uh, that sac Now, what did that burnt offering represent? What did it represent? Okay. What did that burnt offering represent? It represented the offerer. Okay? It represents the person offering. Okay? That th this is, I am, like Paul said, sac you know, um, 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 therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, what was he alluding to there? He was alluding to this. Okay? And so just like we are to offer ourselves as a sacrifice, they offered themselves as a sacrifice as manifested in that that innocent animal that was slaughtered and bled and put on that fire. That represented the person, the whole person who was offering it. Okay. I've always thought it was interesting that in the, in the Spanish Bible, uh, that burnt offering is called the Holocaust. Holocausto. You know, I always thought that was, it struck me when I first read that. It's like, wow. You know, you didn't have the Jews and, the, you know, the Holocaust and, and uh, that offering idea. So, and so now the sacrifice is made. And if a priest entered that tabernacle without washing, he would die. Okay. And so if you're going to enter in, you've got to wash. Here's the water, right? Here's the water. So Peter said that when he talked about Noah and his family being saved through the water, okay, and he likened that to baptism, and then he alludes back to this, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, not that Old Testament washing before you entered the tabernacle, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now, don't we sometimes say, well, the Old Testament, that was physical, and what we have today is spiritual. Mm. Yeah. No, no. When that person offered that burnt offering, that was a spiritual act, right? All of these acts are spiritual. They all uh, speak to the spirit. Okay, or come, you know, in, they're in that realm. Okay, I have to be careful because I have a, a sermon that's going to kind of hit on some of this stuff and trying to click in here. So you had to wash or you die. So no entrance without washing. And so we appeal to God for a good conscience, to wash away our sins. Okay, and I still remember that day, that evening, you know, up at that old, the old Kirkland building. I still remember coming out of that water. It was like, wow. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and then the struggle begins. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, you know, then the struggle begins. Before, it was like, whatever, you know, this is fine. Uh, doing what I want to do. Uh, no pangs of conscience. No, you know, worried about how it affects you or anything. And, and uh, as soon as you come out of that water, you feel really good. But then things have changed. You know, and that becomes more and more apparent as time goes by, you know, and we go through our struggles and, and all that. So, all right, so we, so now we're washed, okay, we, we are, we are priests, we're priesthood, now we're washed, and now we enter into the, uh, into the tabernacle, 
into the sanctuary, um, and we find certain furnishings in there. Okay. And so again, you know, why these particular things, and why was God so adamant that Moses do it exactly as he told him? And the scripture tells us there in Exodus that that's what Moses did. What the Lord commanded him, that's what he did. Okay. So we have a table of what they call the showbread, okay? And this was for the priests, okay? Now, why this table and why bread? Does that, is there something in the future that we do that has to, you know, we, we're sitting here eating bread every, every service, you know? We eat bread. We're priests, and we're eating bread every first day of the week. They're priests. They were eating bread, okay? and it was only for them, except now the law was it was only for the priests, right? But what if somebody was really, really hungry and needed it? Okay? Then God says, you know, of course, I'm thinking of David and his men. You know, they're hungry, then, you know, give it to them. And Jesus points out they ate it and they were they were not guilty. You know, they were blameless even though they ate it because what's God's attitude in all of these things? I desire compassion rather than sacrifice. You know? So God is not, hey, this is my law. That's what I said. You're hungry? Well, oh well. Sorry about that. Okay? He can't do that and then tell us in the New Testament if your brother is, you know, is hungry or thirsty and you say be warmed and filled, what, what use is that? Well, he, you know, that would be real inconsistent, <laughs> wouldn't it, see? Uh, so that's, that's the nature of God. He reveals that about himself. So we have his law, uh, but, when, but if, if compassion requires that that law be set aside, if you will, um, then he'll do it. So there's a, there's a concept that we maybe we'll get into. Let's see, It's called deferring the lesser law for the greater. Okay? Deferring the lesser law for the greater. And so, so that's, an, uh, that's an example of that. Okay? The greater law was compassion. And so he deferred that law that it's only for the priesthood in order for David and his men to have something to eat, okay? And so that's a, that's a fascinating study. We'll, uh, like I said, you know, I, can't, I'm, I bring these things up to you just to impress upon you that how in the world are we gonna have time to, <laughs> to, to do all these things, but I at least want to introduce the concept sometimes. You know, whether we get to it or not, at least the concept, okay? Okay, so we have the showbread, and then we have the candles, this candlestick, the, the menorah, that, that was there to, the law said, to provide light. Uh, so we come into our New Testament. Is there, does the New Testament say anything about light? You know, <laughs> that's a, I mean, it's just all over the place. You know, walk as children of light and walking in the light and, uh, you, know, chill, you know, being of the day and, and all those things. Uh, and so we have, you know, we have, we can walk in the darkness. You know, Jesus talked about that in the book of John, I think John chapter 12. So we can walk in the darkness or we can walk in the light. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You know, he who walks in darkness, you know, don't remember the rest of what it said, but, you know, he doesn't know what he stumbles over. I know that's one part of it there. So. Um, so darkness is usually uh, akin to uh, ignorance, you know, evil that comes from that ignorance and those kind of things. And light has to do with knowledge and understanding and insight, perspective, and those kind of things. And so when God told him to, you know, that that's part of the furnishings, did God have something in mind? Well, he did uh, in every single one of these things. Um, and then we have the veil that, you know, 
Every time that high priest, once a year, went within that veil to offer sacrifice for himself and, and the people, every time the people saw him do that, it was saying, you can't come in here. Okay? You don't have access. You don't have any access here. Only he does. Okay, And then, of course, when Christ was sacrificed, the veil was torn in two, and we mentioned that it was embroidered with the cherubim who were the ones guarding the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were kicked out. No access. But when Jesus died, those cherubim parted. And now, you know, so we can, as we go to that altar, you know, and all, the incense altar, where they offered up the incense, we offer up prayer. And, we, and our prayer is accepted in the very presence of God. All right, so Jesus went as a forerunner for us, and now we have that open access to, to God. Okay. And uh, so, again, just, you know, the connections and the parallels are just, uh, just fascinating. We're out of time. Uh, but, uh, you know, thanks. You know, always enjoy. I look forward to this every Sunday morning and sit up here and see what happens. And uh, so uh, thank you very much. Class dismissed. <laughs>